Um, so, uh, first of all, for students in my histories of the Cold War class, um, I think uh, if you're here, so it means uh, you got my message, right? Uh, and you saw my announcement that this week they're changing the syllabus. And I think that's the right thing to do because we're definitely witnessing history right now, right? Like since the beginning of this semester, we have been talking about the Cold War. And unfortunately, like last three days, I would say, uh, a lot of parallels with the Cold War time and history, right? And especially like when Putin ordered uh, this high level of uh, military forces, it means nuclear weapons be ready. So I, I started to think about the Cuban Missile Crisis more than ever, right? And how the world can be on the brink of the war so easily. And remember when we were talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? And we talk about Dr. Strange Love and the possibility to start the war so easily, right? And it, it sounded like, yeah, it was in the past, right? We're looking at the history lessons. We're looking at the past and it's gone and we live in a different world. But today we see that it's not so far away, right? And unfortunately, wars and a possibility even more global conflict is here, right? I don't want to scare you, but actually the situation is uh, really terrifying. Uh, and of course, I don't know how you cope with the news today, but uh, last week, I mean, since last week, since the beginning of this uh, war, I have been just, you know, stuck in the political news trying to see what's going on. And every morning just, you know, wake up and, and think, what happened? What happened during the night, right? Or like a new bombing or uh, new escalation, uh, more people being killed on both sides, by the way, right? And, you know, we were supposed to have this class uh, with our uh, partner in this uh, class, High School of Economics in St. Petersburg, uh, Russian students there. So I called yesterday uh, to professors there, Yelena Kachitkova and Kirill Chunikin. So when we talk about the situation, and they said, and I saw this on the Russian news, I mean, sort of the Russian news, because uh, you, I don't know if you know that, but all independent media are blocked in Russia now. Um, even uh, like on social media, like Facebook or uh, uh, any platforms like they are, that, uh, it's not possible uh, to discuss the war in Ukraine. Moreover, I can tell you, uh, and it's really, I think it's shameful because even the word itself, war, is prohibited in Russia. It's banned from media. You cannot call this the war. It's called a special military operation in Ukraine. Uh, and it's, it's so cynical uh, because the Russian authorities even say that uh, we wanted to bring peace to Ukraine. How dare, uh, how shameful. Uh, and, but, I mean, I'm really emotional about this because I think two reasons. First of all, um, I have a lot of friends and colleagues in Ukraine. Uh, and what I hear and what I see on the news bombing of Kharkiv and Kiev and people in Ukraine dying because of the Russian uh, military and shells and rockets and tanks being there. And it's just impossible to think how it could happen, right? How the Russian troops could invade Ukraine to kill Ukrainian people. But also we can see more and more news um, that Putin expected kind of a blitzkrieg. And uh, Matthew just yesterday sent me this article. It was kind of uh, asleep in the Russian media. Uh, then the Russian uh, <coughs> news platform, they prepared a news release uh, 
in two days they were planning to post this that Russia won Ukraine. Uh, and Kiev is under the Russian control. So it's just impossible to believe that it's happening right now. But also, because I'm a Russian historian, and all these years, uh, like here at IU or any other universities, I have been trying to say that Russia can be a partner, that Russia is not just an evil empire, uh, that we can collaborate, we can cooperate, we can, you know, live together. And remember when we discussed Khrushchev's peaceful coexistence, right? Uh, it can be more than just that, right? Uh, it can be real collaboration. And like after post, uh, or say, after Cold War, post-Cold War world, that it can be different. And maybe I was naive, but I had this hope but the world can be different. And now we live in this world. Um, and actually, Putin said that the post-Cold War world is over. And actually, he's right. It's over because we live in a different world now. And it, I don't think it won't be the same. Uh, it's changing right now. And the consequences of this war, definitely, but I'm pretty sure, will be long-lasting. And uh, it will impact the whole world. I mean, Europe, first of all. Um, and Ukraine is a part of Europe. It will impact Russia as well. Um, I had some hope that maybe because uh, not all, and I want to say this, not all Russians support this war. Not all Russians support uh, Putin's claim or uh, believe in Putin's propaganda. Uh, about uh, this war, thank you. Uh, and um, I am proud of Russian people, the Russian people uh, who tried last few days to oppose this war, uh, to protest this war, uh, to go to the streets of Moscow and St. Petersburg. And I saw kind of a schedule for many Russian cities where people were planning to go to the streets to protest. And now, I don't know how many exactly, but last news I saw more than 6,000 people were arrested because of this anti-war protest in Russia. Oh, but that's a shame. And that's, I'm ashamed of Russia in this case uh, because of what the Putin's government did. That's a war crime. And I do hope that who started this war will be responsible for this and you'll take this responsibility eventually, in some way or another. We have another seat here, or oh, here, you can go here. Uh, okay, uh, so it was kind of, sorry for a very emotional introduction because it's there and the war is going. Uh, and I'm proud of the Ukrainian people who fight back and the Putin's plan to take over Ukraine in two days, it failed. And First time I, I thought, like, how, if you look at the map, right, how, how brave, how heroic you have to be to fight the Russian army, right, and all the farming there. Okay, but let's go back to history, because for today class and for today lecture, our goal, let's try to understand why. Uh, why does Russia have, I wouldn't say Russia, in this case the Russian government, uh, <clears throat> make these claims uh, on Ukrainian territory? Why for many Russians Ukraine is part of Russia, to the Russian eyes, that's so part of Russia? Uh, why Ukraine kind of makes a special case in the Russian history? And I can tell you that probably if you look at the history of the Russian Empire, or even back uh, to the beginning of Russian history, of course, we can understand why Ukraine matters so much. So, um, and that's our first goal for today, to understand the complexities of history, and as I call this kind of intertwined, entangled history of Russia and Ukraine. It's impossible to write history of Russia without Ukraine, but also, 
we have to write history of Ukraine with a strong Russian presence. You cannot separate uh, these two nations, these two countries. So that's the first point and that's our first goal for today, kind of try to understand uh, what the connections, what the conflicts, what the ties between Ukraine and Russia <coughs> and what the barriers there. So the second goal, let's try to understand how historical imagination works and why the question of historical borders also matters, but also how dangerous it might be uh, to think about historical borders and how dangerous may be uh, an attempt uh, to draw these borders again or reconstitute uh, <clears throat> these historical borders. Why it's so dangerous and where it can lead. The third question and the third point for our lecture today, are <clears throat> let's see not just the complexities uh, this imperial history, but let's try to see a bigger picture uh, and to see how it's not just about Russia and Ukraine. That's a bigger question. That's a question of the empires. And actually, for today, because um, I'm a historian of imperial Russia, not uh, so much um, research done on Soviet time, so, and I think it's also uh, all Putin's references are uh, <clears throat> kind of point out to imperial history. Uh, it's a ground for this historical imagination, speaking not just about the Soviet past, but about imperial past, about the Russian Empire, and also even see the Soviet Union uh, in these imperial terms. So that's a question of the empires, and also not just the empires, but nation states and nation building. So let's try to see different ideas and different questions here. And let's start with this. Uh, so I'm not promising you a crash course on Ukrainian-Russian history in 40 minutes. That's not possible. Once again, because that's an ancient history. And there are uh, <coughs> many centuries of this history. So it's impossible to cover. It could be a special course, you know, maybe for the whole semester just to talk about this history, right? So I'm just trying to emphasize some points, some key moments um, that would be helpful to understand the current situation. Okay, uh, and I put this slide first because uh, I think how it started. Um, I mean, it started not now. Uh, we can see some really worrisome signs uh, of Russian military mood and expansion and imperial ideology being definitely present. Um, but we also can see how just um, in recent past uh, in the Russian government and Putin's regime emphasized more and more uh, the Russian geopolitical interests, the historical borders, and the role of Russia in the world. And of course, the question of security. It became one of the uh, most important cards uh, in these conversations. Uh, so, uh, and I think uh, this picture I took, uh, it was kind of just, you can see now if you look at the internet, a lot of different photographs, but I think this picture is really telling uh, and kind of ironical, uh, Putin looking at the map, but all his recent speeches about history of Russia, history of the Russian Empire, history of Ukraine, he wouldn't pass my course, that's for sure. Uh, because uh, even simple fact checking would show that it's just a political speculation. That's historical imagination. But how he wanted things to look like and how now uh, official Kremlin propaganda uh, tells this story about this imaginable past, but also playing really strongly this card about the great Russian empire, not directly, but it's there. Uh, Russia as a great power, as a great country, and you probably can see some familiar rhetoric uh, there. But also, uh, I was really happy to see uh, this picture 
in the internet as sort of a response of Putin looking at the map, right? Uh, because definitely, um, I think it also reflects some concerns. Because you can, if you can claim that you can take this territory because of the Russian population there, or the Russian language, or other reasons, why not go further, right, and find uh, the same reasons in other countries? Uh, so, and I think it was just a perfect response uh, to these uh, <coughs> kind of political uh, speculations and uh, political claims. Okay, uh, but let's. Uh, go there. Uh, I'm not going so far, like 10, 12, 15 centuries back, uh, but I wanted to show you this map because if you can see uh, the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea, right, Kiev and Rus, Kiev, right there. Uh, so there Russian history began. Uh, and uh, if you read any Russian history textbook, Russian history begins there, in Kievan Rus. And actually, it explains a lot, because from the beginning, in uh, you know, school education, any history lessons, uh, for the Russian people, uh, Kiev, that kind of cradle of the Russian civilization, that the beginning of the Russian history, and because of this idea, it's pretty common, you know, to see this territory as Russia, at the beginning of Russia, cradle of Russia. So, uh, and you can see, uh, like, uh, in all historical maps, this emphasis on Kiev and ancient Rus, it's there. And the term Rus itself, it's originated there. So that's just one point why Kiev is so important, why this territory is so symbolic, and why it speaks so loudly uh, <clears throat> to the Russians in this case. Okay, and very quickly, uh, I just wanted to emphasize, if you look at the history of Russia, that's a history, as famous Russian historian Vasily Kluchevsky said in the late 19th century, uh, that's a history of colonization. That's a history of territorial growth. That's a history of expansion. So I thought it would be really helpful just to look at the maps and see how Russia was expanding, growing, how this Russian empire was forming. So, and you can see here, and this period of time is really important because if you look the 16th, the 17th, and the 18th century, three centuries, really crucial for forming, for growing, <clears throat> for defining the Russian Empire. Uh, so, and if you look here, uh, <coughs> see, um, <coughs> let's look, this bright yellow, right? Uh, you can see, uh, but it's not Kiev at the point here anymore, right? Uh, uh, and you can see this territory at the beginning, right? And in the 16th century, this huge expansion through the 17th century, eastbound, right? Uh, but not just eastbound, we can see some movements and, expand, and expansion and colonizing territories here to um, westbound and to the south. So, but you can see how rapidly, I mean, relatively rapidly, right? Given like three centuries, but in terms of Russian history, it's quite rapidly. Uh, the Russian Empire uh, was uh, growing. Uh, and then, very simple map. I just I was trying uh, to point out major steps here. Uh, so you can see also these different colors so and different acquisitions. And also if you look at this map, you can find Kiev here, the yellow color here, right? But also, well, it's really important, this movement to the Black Sea, right? And you can see how the Russian Empire formed in its borders are uh, going, expanding, and trying to get access to the Baltic Sea, to the Black Sea, to the Pacific Ocean, right? Uh, but this area, and you can see probably familiar geo names here, that you can see Warsaw and think about Poland, right? You can see Kiev and think about Ukraine. Uh, <clears throat> you can see even Finland here. So, <clears throat> uh, grow, growing, expanding, uh, conquering, uh, 
bringing more territory. So we can see this uh, imperial uh, growth. Uh, and this map, you can see, that the, one of the final ones. Uh, if you look closely here, what you can see, that's green area here, Ukraine, right? And Kiev, that's a part of the Russian Empire. And I will go back how it became a part of the Russian Empire, why Ukraine uh, became a part of the Russian Empire. But also you can see Caucasus, Poland, Baltic states, Central Asia, uh, Turkestan, of course, huge area of uh, Siberia. So, but also if you look at these uh, borders in red, that the borders of the Soviet Union. And you can see that after the collapse of the Russian Empire, uh, after World War I, when many empires also collapsed, right? It was kind of a common thing. Uh, but then the Soviet Union mostly reconstituted itself. A very similar borders. You can see, except Poland, Baltic states, Baltic states were uh, included, let's say, in the Soviet Union right before World War II. And it was uh, Stalin's deal with Hitler about that. Right? Uh, but you can see how uh, this area became also a part of the Soviet Union, and Ukraine became, first of all, one of the first uh, Soviet national republics uh, when the Soviet Union was formed in 1922, but then one of the 15 uh, Soviet republics in the long history of the Soviet Union. And then the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, right? And, <clears throat> Now Ukraine is so-called, I don't like this word, post-Soviet, because it sounds really colonial as well. When you measure all history before Soviet, post-Soviet, uh, Ukraine an independent state after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But it doesn't mean that history of Ukraine began after the collapse of the Soviet Union or after the collapse of the Russian Empire. It began much, much earlier. And as Ukrainian uh, historians often say, it began even earlier than the Russian history. Uh, so uh, let's uh, <clears throat> see. And uh, you know, I love historical maps. They can be another way to manipulate, right? You can draw some boundaries. You can draw some political borders. You can name some places. Places and that might be a political means, a political weapons as well, right? Uh, but I think it's really important to see uh, some geopolitical situation and different countries and different borders because it will help us to understand how complicated history is, right? Uh, and also, I don't know how many people uh, in the United States could find Ukraine on the map before this war, right? Uh, maybe many, uh, maybe not so many, uh, but definitely uh, find some, looking at the map is very instructive. Uh, okay, and uh, I will go back to this map because just for now, just to emphasize, that's a map you can see from the 18th century, kind of showing the situation, the geopolitical situation in the 18th century. And that's one of the important points here. So you can see the Russian Empire here, right? Uh, you can see Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and that's really important because history of Ukraine is really closely tied to the history of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, at this time. You can also see Habsburg Empire here, right? You can see Swedish Empire here, Sweden, um, and Ottoman Empire. And that's really important uh, because it's not just about, once again, uh, you can see the place of Ukraine here, right? Uh, that's not a nation state at this time, but that's another story, right? A long history of nation building and how uh, nation states, in some cases, emerging from the empires or building on different grounds. And it might be a different time, right, and in different circumstances. Uh, so, but it's really important to see, uh, because if you look at the map, why this territory 
was, has been really contested all time. Why it has been so important geopolitically uh, to control this territory, to use this territory, and why so uh, many times this territory became a war ground. So looking at the map, it can, once again, it can help us to understand why Ukraine matters for Russia, why, for example, uh, I think that's a good example, not directly connected with the imperial history, but kind of showing this imperial legacy and this imperial ideology in the Soviet time. One example, not connected with the 18th century, but connected why Ukraine is so important geopolitically. After World War I and the Russian Revolution of 1917, then Bolsheviks Russia, new socialist Russia, uh, tried to end the war and quit the war. Uh, and the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed. And the head of the Soviet delegation there was Leo Trotsky. And Trotsky said, we cannot lose Ukraine. Because without Ukraine, Russia will be a third-rate power. See, even at this time, this idea that Russia without Ukraine cannot keep its great status, its role in the world. Third-rate power without Ukraine. So, and actually, it shows really clearly why Russia was trying to keep Ukraine at any means. So, but also, once again, to emphasize that it's, uh, this uh, territory, this crossroads, I think that's a good term. Ukraine is a crossroads of Europe. Uh, it was also called the borderlands. But that's uh, also a very interesting term. Think about words we use to define borderlands. Borderlands of what? Borderlands of the Russian Empire, borderlands of uh, Polish, Lithuanian Commonwealth, borderlands of the Ottoman Empire, Habsburg Empire, those borderlands, right? Or, or crossroads. So, but uh, the geopolitical situation and the location, the territory, really matters here. Uh, and the last geographical comments, so it's not a geography lesson, but sometimes it could be useful as well, right? Uh, especially for the politicians. Not just history lessons, but geography lessons. Uh, so, um, you can, uh, I don't know if you can see here, uh, but uh, uh, the river uh, Dnieper uh, was really important because it became a border between uh, right bank and left bank Ukraine. And actually it was kind of a border between Poland and Russia, dividing Ukraine. And that's another history, uh, pretty common case. You can think about world history and partition of Poland, uh, how uh, Polish territory was divided between great empires. So we can see the case of Ukraine being divided between Poland uh, and Russia uh, in the 18th century. Uh, so that's really important point. So think about this and think why Ukraine matters and why it's so important geopolitically. But also, aside from that, that's another thing. Uh, so let's, uh, we can go back to this map later. Uh, I wanted to show you this painting uh, at this point. Uh, that's uh, every kid, I think, every student uh, in Russia knows this painting. Uh, a famous Russian uh, artist, Ilya Repin, uh, <clears throat> created this in 1891. He, uh, he was working uh, a while, several years on this painting. Uh, the title of this, uh, the Cossacks uh, is writing a response uh, to the Ottoman uh, Empire. So, but uh, that's the idea of the Cossacks. And that's another term I need to explain. Maybe I don't need, but just in case. Uh, the Cossacks, uh, living in the territory uh, near uh, uh, the Dnieper, uh, and it created a, a very specific zone. And you can see here 
that's kind of another symbol of Ukraine, the Kazakhs, and especially one zone, uh, and it kind of leads us back uh, to the map, uh, Zaporozhian siege. That's a special zone, having a special status, uh, serving as, let's say, a defensive area, protecting Poland, Russia, uh, uh, being like frontier zone in the steppe, where Kazakhs were uh, serving as militaries, but also farming uh, this land. But the most important kind of symbolic connotation, of course, aside from all these practical terms as being kind of defensive area in this frontier steppe zone, it was a land of freedom. Because the Kazakhs, they denied any uh, you know, restrictions, taxes, conscriptions. Uh, they elected their own uh, leaders, hetman. Uh, you can see some kind of like headman, but hetman, uh, hetmanate uh, as a uh, definition of the state uh, in <clears throat> Ukraine. So, and you can see here kind of this feeling of freedom and kind of joking and laughing and just, we don't care. And it's a, a, a whole story about how many jokes, um, even not a proper one, they put in this letter trying to respond that they're not going um, you know, to subjugate to anyone. Uh, and that's another idea of Ukraine. Zaporozhian siege, freedom, or in Russian that's volia, that's the Russian word uh, meaning freedom, no restrictions. And actually, many Russian serfs, thinking about American slaves, kind of, you know, we talk about this in class. <clears throat> many Russian serfs trying to flee to this area because uh, it, it was an idea that if they escape there, they will become free as well. So this idea of freedom is really important. Uh, so uh, we can see uh, the Kazakh is a sort of free agents uh, and being committed to idea of some egalitarian ideas, right? Uh, and also uh, very important that it's kind of an opposite, the idea of the Moscow state, right? We can see this like a different political entity uh, uh, created there. But slowly, but surely, uh, because of the uh, political movements and the growing expansion. Uh, even this area, and we can go uh, back to the map, you can see Zaporozhian uh, lands there. Uh, so Kharkiv, now you can see Kharkiv on the map because of the political news, right? So Zaporozhian land, Zaporozhian siege uh, became a part of the Russian Empire. The Kazakhs became the ordinary subjects of the Russian Tsars, but still enjoyed some privileges. Uh, unlike the Russian source uh, in the Russian uh, Empire. So having kind of a separate deal inside the Russian Empire. Uh, and uh, still being really important geopolitically in the history of the Russian Empire. But also, mm, what's important, and go back here, uh, one more history fact, and I think you need to know that. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at this monument, and think again about history and commemoration and how we uh, look at history through monuments, right? And how many times monuments um, are getting more and more political significance and became kind of a subject of political disputes, right? Think about Confederation and Confederates Monument in the United States. But, um, you know, just recently I realized, I look at this uh, monument and thought, it looks pretty similar to the monument of Peter the Great in St. Petersburg. If you remember this famous symbol of St. Petersburg uh, and Peter the Great on the horse, you know, uh, on this huge stone. Mm. So this monument to Bakhtan Khmelnytsky, uh, who is seen as, as a symbol, one of the kind of founders uh, of Ukraine, but being really a controversial figure in Ukrainian and in Russian history. And this monument, and think about this, was erected by the Russian government in Kiev, that the central Sophia Square in Kiev, um, was erected by the Russian government, the Russian sculptor, uh, Mikhail Mikeshin, uh, and you can see the date here, 1888. Uh, <clears throat> so inside the Russian Empire, uh, we can see how they celebrated 
Bogdan Khmelnytsky as a man who connected or in Russian uh, version integrated uh, Ukraine uh, into Russia. So, and two very important dates. I don't want to kind of uh, <coughs> to overwhelm you with uh, different dates, but these two are really important in the relations between Ukraine and Russia. And in history class, you need to think about them. So, uh, <coughs> 1654, Pyrrhus Agreement, and that's exactly where uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky uh, came mm, and played his role. Uh, mm, and uh, you can go back and look at Pyrrhuslav at the map that's uh, <clears throat> uh, Ukrainian territory where this agreement was made. But once again, uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky and this agreement is a subject of huge debates. So, why? Why this agreement? What was in this agreement that it became so debatable, so controversial? Uh, for example, uh, from the Ukrainian side, I don't like to speak about sides, right? Because it's, it sounds probably not right. Uh, but if you look at the Ukrainian scholars, or even back in time, how this agreement was seen uh, from Ukraine, it was um, a way to build an alliance between Russia and the Kazakhs, Hakanite, Ukraine, uh, for, and actually to get uh, some Moscow protectorate uh, for this territory because of the uh, different foreign threats, specifically from Poland. So, uh, see the keywords allies. Uh, Moscow protectorate, temporarily, that's, that's not about subjugation, that's not about incorporation, right? That's not about inclusion, this territory into the Russian Empire. Uh, but if you see the description of this agreement and the role of Bogdan Khmelnytsky in Russian history textbooks, for example, it will be that uh, <clears throat> it was, and recently I found this description uh, sounds really um, I would say striking because it was put as it was a liberation of Ukraine from Poland. And now when we can see all this uh, political rhetoric about liberation, right, it sounds kind of uh, uh, really uh, <clears throat> unfortunate. So liberation from Poland, but not just liberation of this uh, territory, but liberation of uh, uh, Eastern Slavs brothers of the Russian people. So uh, from both sides, this agreement was seen differently, right? Uh, but pretty soon, mm, uh, this territory, uh, and it was uh, uh, exactly, we, we can say this, left bank uh, and Kiev, left bank of uh, the river Dnieper and Kiev, became part of the Moscow state of the Russian Empire. Uh, and why this date is also important. Uh, so it was an agreement, but seen differently, but it was one of the major steps uh, establishing the relations, the status, and some political movements between Russia and Ukraine. But also, if we jump into the 20th century, in 1954, think about this, in 1954, celebrating the Pyrrhuslav Agreement and the role of Bogdan Khmelnytsky, and uh, as it was celebrated at the beginning of Russian-Ukrainian ties and friendship, uh, the Russian premier Nikita Khrushchev gave Crimea to Ukraine as a sign and kind of uh, commemorating so the dates are really important here. So Crimea became a part of the Ukrainian Republic in 1954. So 300 years uh, later after this agreement. And now you can think uh, why in 2014, uh, when Putin claimed Crimea, uh, he referred to this uh, Khrushchev act saying that 
it was kind of a distortion of history to give Russian territory to Ukraine. So it became even more uh, politically uh, controversial here. So think about this. And then the next death, date is really important, uh, uh, 1667. And it was uh, what I have already mentioned, this uh, kind of um, partition. Then Russia and Poland agreed uh, to divide Ukraine and uh, the left bank of the Dnieper River and Kiev became part of Moscow state, and the right bank of the Dnieper became part of Poland. And Zaporozhian siege, the Cossacks I mentioned before, uh, kept their special status to defend the steppe frontier. Uh, and then, just really briefly, two other steps here. Then uh, Peter the Great, in early 18th century, during the Northern War with Sweden, made other steps uh, to abolish some special status and freedom uh, because he saw uh, like Hetmanate and uh, the Ukrainian Cossacks and Hetman Mazipa uh, as a lie of Sweden in this case. And then Catherine the Great further incorporating this territory into the Russian Empire, abolishing freedom, creating new administration, setting new rules for taxation, uh, enlarging our uh, military horizons in Ukraine. Uh, and finally, finally, uh, in uh, <coughs> well, abolishing the Ukrainian hetmanate at all. And I want to cite here uh, Catherine the Great after uh, she abolished Hetmanate uh, as, a state, as, a, as it was put political uh, unit. She said, and she used this word uh, to define Ukraine in the Russian Empire, little Russia. So it was the great Russia, little Russia, and white Russia, Belarus. Uh, so little Russia, or in Russian that's Mala Russia, Mala Russia. So Little Russia became kind of official name for uh, Ukraine in the Russian Empire. It was officially used. It was part of the title of the Russian Tsar, the Russian Emperor, Little Russia. So Catherine the Great, the Russian Empress in the late 18th century, said after abolishing Hetmanate and the uh, Hetman uh, uh, and the position of Ukraine, when Little Russia no longer has a hetman, one should try to make people forget both the era and the names of the hetmans. So kind of to abolish, to erase history. So you can see how history is connected here. It was a political reform here. It was a further uh, incorporation uh, of Ukraine into the Russian Empire but we also can see how history uh, played a role here. But, uh, speaking of, uh, I don't want just to state how the Russian Empire conquered territory, because in this case, if you're just telling this story, it means how Russia uh, made Ukraine part, a part of the empire. I want to emphasize another side here, how Ukraine impacted Russia. Because it's not just about the Russian impact on Ukraine, right? Not just all these territorial changes, administrative political reforms, but it's also about impact of Ukraine on Russia. Because if you don't talk about that, the kind of, uh, you know, we will be repeating the same imperial narrative, and we don't want to. Uh, so, speaking of Ukrainian impact, I would say, first of all, and I want to emphasize this, it was a huge cultural impact. Because in the 17th century, for example, Kiev Mahila Academy, uh, one of the leading educational cultural institutions uh, in Ukraine, became a source for scholars, uh, for politicians, uh, for culture bearers in Russia. And we can see how impact of clerics and scholars coming from Ukraine to Russia, bringing, for example, in the 18th century, Baroque forms, new political ideas, and also even uh, the idea of 
imperial identity or national identity, it's connected with Ukraine. And we can just name uh, scholars being in Moscow, being in Kiev, uh, and developing these new ideas, and becoming a huge uh, cultural and educational uh, segment in the Russian Empire. Uh, and <clears throat> in some history books, uh, we can find it's kind of very interesting hidden part there, like hidden pages. We can find how Ukrainian scholars, mostly Ukrainian clerics uh, in the 18th century, came to define the Russian culture. And you can see this kind of a historical a cultural twist, right? That's not just about Russian culture defining uh, the territory of Ukraine, but Ukrainian culture defining Russian culture impacting, influencing the Russian culture. Uh, and of course, not just uh, you know, through like education, uh, political ideas, literature, music, architecture. Uh, <clears throat> so we can see a lot of ways uh, to bring this cultural influence. And one more quote I want to bring here, uh, and actually I highly recommend. Um, I will make a list of books on Ukrainian history for you guys, just uh, to post on the uh, canvas site so you can uh, <coughs> read more. Um, Sergei Plohi, uh, one of the leading his, uh, historians, Ukrainian historians, historians in Harvard. Uh, and I think this quote is really important and really telling. Uh, he said, the entanglement of the concept of nationality and imperial statehood that took place during the encounter between Kievan and Moscovite elites appears to have been crucial for the formation of Russian imperial identity and additionally for the invention of Russia. So and you can see how the Ukraine what means how the Ukrainian scholars contributed uh, to the um, Invention of Russia, it means the idea of Russia, the Russian imperial identity, uh, the Russian um, role in the world, and how uh, ironically, paradoxically, right, we can see uh, the Ukrainian influence uh, there. Uh, and <clears throat> also, uh, what I want to emphasize, uh, when they see further uh, the relations between Ukraine and Russia, of course, uh, they were evolving. Even being part, but don't forget that part of Ukraine was uh, uh, part of Poland. Uh, Poland, you can uh, think about Galicia, the part of Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, part um, of the Russian Empire. So it's really complicated and contested, once again, contested territory. Uh, but in the 19th century, Ukraine became really important for the modernization of Russian Empire. And that's another aspect, because Ukraine, of course, it was a breadbasket, right? And we know that. And Ukraine suffered for that uh, in the 20th century, going through uh, to just catastrophic famines, especially Holodomor uh, in the 19, uh, early 1930s, Stalin's uh, <coughs> crime, uh, but also uh, you know, one of the most tragic history um, uh, pages in the Ukrainian history. So the breadbasket of the Russian Empire, Ukraine. Also, it became a very important source of natural resources, because in the late 19th century, early 20th century, we can see coal mining in Ukraine. Uh, we can see uh, sugar plantation in Ukraine. We can see very intensive road, uh, railroad building in Ukraine. Um, and of course, it's not just the Russian capital uh, investing um, <clears throat> in these enterprises uh, modernizing the empire, creating new economic great power, but also uh, we can see uh, <clears throat> a lot of foreign capital because Russia didn't have enough um, to invest in this new economic project to industrialize, to modernize the empire uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, so, and for example, now this really uh, uh, the area uh, in the focus of the attention of the whole world, Donbass area. And now we call, of course, we know about the Donbass war, right? And this area now familiar to many people. So Donbass 
became one of the most prominent sites for coal mining uh, and um, one of the kind of mostly rapidly developed, uh, economically developed uh, region in the Russian Empire. Uh, but also, history of Ukraine didn't stop even after the collapse of the Russian Empire. And you can see how World War I impacted this territory. Uh, and how uh, after the Russian Revolution, Ukraine, again going back to the map, became part of the Soviet empire of nations. So that's uh, what I tried to emphasize, this kind of complicated history. Uh, and I put a link here. That's one of the uh, really respectful historians of uh, the Soviet uh, Union, uh, Victoria Smolkin. She is teaching in Veslin. Um, and uh, that's just a, a really short pause. But I like what she put there as a title. Speaking of the Putin's claim, and that's his another speech. See how often he uh, has used history. Uh, because he claimed in his uh, recent speech that the Bolsheviks gave this territory to Ukraine, now current territory, and created Ukraine as a state. And I think that's a perfect response from Victoria Smokin. Fantasy is not history. But you can see how history is often used to manipulate, to speculate. Uh, and being a historian, I can just say that we need history lessons. Not uh, because I think it can create a kind of a barrier. It's, in this case, it's not so easy to manipulate the public opinion. And once again, uh, for many Russians, what's going on in Ukraine now, it's also a tragedy. But unfortunately, for many Russians, it's a special operation because they see Ukraine as a part of Russia. OK, I'm stopping here. Uh, First time, I write on time, uh, <coughs> this lecture. OK, now, uh, questions. And I have some questions for you also. But let's start with your questions. Questions? Mm -hmm. What was the Donbass's significance during uh, the Soviet period? Did it carry that same sort of weight that it kind of does today as a geopolitical barrier between yeah, because that's Eastern Ukraine, of course, you can see, you know, go back to the map, you can see how, uh, that's uh, at the border, right? That's kind of, once again, I don't like this word, uh, borderland, right? But we can see how important uh, this zone geopolitically, but also, that's a mining region. Uh, the major reaches of coal, there. Uh, and, uh, of course, also you can see, uh, natural resources for the Russian economy, that's a strategic thing, right? And now when we talk about uh, different economic sanctions in Russia, that's first of all, right? You would think about Russian gas and like Nord Stream 2, uh, and a <clears throat> different way to export Russian uh, gas and oil, right, uh, to other countries because that's a major source of the Russian federal budget of the Russian economy, that's a staple. Uh, so that's a mining region, that's a coal region, uh, but also another thing, of course, that's kind of the location right along the Russian border. Uh, and it's really important to think about um, who populated this territory. And it, it, because uh, it became a really big part uh, in political statements now in Russia that it's not about Ukraine, that's about Russian people living there, right, in Donbass. Uh, and um, uh, this idea. Uh, backed up by Kremlin to support this uh, separatist movement to create independent republics in Luhansk and Donetsk. Uh, so let's uh, kind of say that the Russian population there, that the Russian territory because of the population. But once again, if you look at, um, for example, at the maps and the, uh, even go back to the 19th century, 1897 uh, imperial census, um, according to this, late 19th century once again, uh, Russian population in Ukraine, or how it was called, Little Russia, right? Uh, it was larger than in uh, any other non-Russian 
uh, parts of the empire, but it was 13 percent. So it's st still not a majority, but it also depended on the territory. Like in Kiev and Kharkov, of course, uh, the, the Russian populated these uh, territories uh, more. But you can think that it was kind of a mix. And in this uh, story, what I also want to emphasize, if you think about like Crimea or Ukraine, Donbass, right, as a part of this uh, kind of a buffer zone, right? Um, but we think about like Ukrainian people, Russian people, right? But think about Crimea and Crimean Tatars living there. Or think about Jewish population living in Ukraine. So uh, uh, ethnically, it's, it's really mixed. Uh, but during the Russian imperial time, of course, a lot of Russians moved there, right? Settled there um, in Ukraine, I mean. Uh, but also a lot of Ukrainians moved into the Russian territory voluntarily or later on involuntarily, right, in the Soviet time. Uh, so that's a lot of mobility, that's a lot of movement, and different ethnic groups really uh, kind of now we can see how, how it uh, resulted in this really diverse and, and mixed ethnic map of, uh, of these territories. Yeah, but because of the buffer zone, I mean, now it's really important because when Putin uh, claimed that uh, Ukraine should be demilitarized, right, and this uh, also another claim about denazification of Ukraine. Uh, it connects with the history of World War II, right? And also it connects with the history of the collapse of the Soviet Union and dissolution of the Warsaw Pact and expanding NATO. So that's a, still a part of history of the 20th century. So we can talk more about this as a buffer zone, right? And why uh, it's important really geopolitically important for the Russian government uh, to keep this zone as a Russian zone of influence and control. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about one of Putin's motivations that he claims being like denazification of Russia. Um, how large are the like far-right military groups that he's talking about actually? Because he would, he would make it out to be that like the entirety of Ukraine's military is, is uh, far-right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I assume that's not the case, but how large are those groups actually? Uh, I mean, first of all, this uh, slogan of the Nazification of Ukraine, right? Uh, I just cannot stand this uh, because, uh, I mean, first of all, if you go back to World War II, right, uh, and they see this territory of Ukraine, like once again re being really diverse like Western Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, it's still there, this kind of division, right? Uh, internal division of that, or Galicia, or Bukovina. Uh, so, and <clears throat> for Western part of Ukraine, and we can compare this, for example, the Baltic states. Uh, um, I would say it was uh, some, uh, there were some hopes that the uh, Germans coming they can liberate them from the Soviet rule, from the Soviet regime, from the Stalin's regime, right? So there were some hopes about that. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't deny that uh, during uh, World War II, uh, they were really strong anti-Russian, anti-Soviet, or let's say anti-communists uh, <clears throat> movements inside Ukraine. Uh, but Ukraine suffered so much during World War II. And for example, if you watch um, a documentary filmed um, by Sergei Laznitsa, um, a Ukrainian filmmaker based now in Germany, about, uh, it's called Bobby Yar. That's one of the uh, probably most, um, I don't know how to even to, to describe this, right? Uh, that's not just mass killing, mass murder. That's, uh, I mean, you can compare with Holocaust, definitely in the same terms, but in Ukraine, right? Uh, because of the Jewish population there, right? Uh, and it was really strong uh, guerrilla movement against Nazis in Ukraine. And I think Natalia Spilova is going to uh, give a lecture on memory uh, because what's a great book we published last year about war memory in Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. Belarus. 
uh, and how this memory of war actually impacted the situation now. But I wouldn't even talk about the Nazification of Ukraine. Of course, I mean, every country now, unfortunately, has some far-right military groups, but that's, that's not a reason, that's not the case, that's not an excuse, right? Uh, and also trying to picture the Ukrainian government as how Putin said in his uh, last remark. Uh, he described the Ukrainian government uh, and Zelensky, of course, uh, as a gang of drug addicts and Nazi. Isn't Zelensky Jewish? Yes. Yes. And I can just, you know, respect Zelensky, how he has been acting. And uh, I mean, I think he's just a decent person, right? And that's, that's, yeah. But you can see that this claim, it actually, that's uh, a slogan about denazification. Uh, it's appealed to the Russian people because memory of World War II, and remember we discussed this in class, it's so significant, it's so crucial for the current state identity, memory of World War, World War II kind of constituted this identity. So, and this appeal, that's for that, kind of to justify this invasion, this war. Mm -hmm. It's worth noting about Zelensky that there were several Ukrainians who come out and made statements they did not vote for him, but were quite happy he's now in charge. And they, either way this ends, so I have a hero to a lot of people, and there's videos of him out with people fighting even here at the front lines. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And I can say, yeah, yeah, I can admit that, uh, of course, I, I couldn't vote, right? I, I'm not an Ukrainian citizen, but I was kind of, you know, skeptical thinking about uh, Zelensky coming to politics and thinking, oh, that's another kind of populist move there. But now what I can see is definitely he deserves a respect, and I, I think now you, you're totally right that even people who didn't vote for him now see that it was the right decision, right? And he didn't uh, flee Ukraine even despite that he had these offers. Yanukovych, who was pro-Kremlin, just fled to Russia after Mr. Maidan. Where he's wearing an armor plate with a gun in his hands fighting yeah, I think it's kind of, you know, because what I can see, uh, but also what it's very, it's, it's really bad that uh, uh, many Russians just cannot access this information because of this media blockade in Russia now. It's really hard for them because like the state TV censor it, just pouring all these, uh, I would say, I don't know how to call this, just, I would say, lies uh, and propaganda thing. Um, and I know many people already, like my friends in Russia, uh, they try to get access, like using like, VPN or try to get some independent platforms or looking at Instagram, like people, what people in Ukraine posted there, just to get access. But for many people, it's not uh, even a way to get this information. So and you can see how this, in, uh, even, you know, the area of information, how it's important, right? How, how important to talk about this, how important uh, to spread uh, the information, not to stay silent what's going on. Because otherwise, and I think it's, it's the right position um, when people in Russia, for example, stay, say, if you just stay silent, it means we support this, right? But it's really hard to oppose too, so think about this. When you live in an authoritarian state, it's really hard to protest. 